Uh, hey, City Center Church, man, so glad that you're with us at our digital location. Uh, no matter where you are watching from, we want to say we are so glad that you took some time today to connect with us. Come on, if you're watching all the way on the East Coast or if you're here on the West Coast, man, we had just an amazing Easter season celebrating the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, but doing it on two coasts in two locations. And it was such an amazing weekend. And I want to thank you so much for being there. If you were part of that gathering or if you served, man, we are still riding on the excitement from this last weekend. So thank you so much. And if you're new, man, we want to encourage you, take some time to get connected with us. Uh, a best way for you to do that is just to, to scan the QR code or you can reach out to us on our website. Man, we are about relationships. We're not just about Sunday, but we're about everyday life. We want to support you. And we want you to know that you can belong to this family way before you ever believe. And so, man, we are excited. Well, we are in now week two of our series called Doubters Club. And um, I want to talk about building furniture. Uh, how many of you guys love or enjoy building furniture? Come on, put it in the comments uh, if you do. If you don't like it, put that in the comments also. But one of my biggest passions that many people don't know is I love to build furniture. Yes, building things. You give me anything from any store and I can build it. Man, uh, there's just been times when uh, my wife has said, hey, let me help build, or my kids. I'm like, no, this is like my time to relax. And so I love building. One of the hardest uh, companies to build furniture for is Ikea. Uh, man, I know some of you that you were like, what? And then others of you were like, man, I know exactly what you're talking about. Because Ikea, they don't give you good instructions. They give you this little manual and they give you some pictures and it's so hard to build. And I remember when I was the Dean of Student Life at a college and I was building tons of wardrobes. And I remember constructing the wardrobes and also deconstructing them because I'd put pieces in the wrong spots. But I think we all know that when you are constructing something, if you don't follow the directions or if you don't understand it, or if you've never done it or experienced it before, it's very difficult. And so that construction that you made, now you have to deconstruct it. And then imagine trying to help someone who's already started to construct something for you and then trying to help finish it. It's so hard. And when I think about deconstruction and construction, I think about where we are in our society today as we think about the series called Doubters Club. And if you look around our world right now, there are so many people both constructing and deconstructing and reconstructing faith. And I just want to give you some quick definitions of construction in the realms of faith. Construction is building your belief system and worldview, while deconstruction is challenging that worldview and subsequent beliefs. And then reconstructing is rebuilding a new, more holistic set of beliefs or worldviews. We're in a pandemic right now in our society when it comes to faith because there are so many people that are de deconstructing the, the building of faith that they have. And in some cases, that deconstructions happen because of doubts, right? Or that deconstruction has happened uh, because of fears or issues that they've seen. And so what I want to do is just take these first few minutes to just talk about deconstruction and reconstruction and where we are at as a society and then bring us back around to even last week where we said, man, doubts um, are okay. Deconstruction of the faith happens in our society because people don't like the answers or non-answers that the church has offered when it comes to their questions. Have you ever been there where you've asked a question, why this or why that, or just wondering or trying to better understand and you feel like those questions aren't validated or you have doubts and questions and what happens is people say that it's like a lack of faith that you have that and so you you pull even further away or people deconstruct their faith because churches have deconstructed jesus's message i believe that so many times there's a deconstruction of faith because we as a church have actually deconstructed the message that jesus was communicating 
People deconstruct because they don't like the Jesus that they see because really they don't know him. What they do know though is they know religion, right? And they know what's been taught to them and they know what their pastors have told them and what our culture is showing them. And so any if that's the question like why do people choose to truly deconstruct their faith and it's because the doubts are met with criticism and questions are met with judgment because Christians actually stopped representing the Jesus of the Bible and started representing Western judgmental uh, pharisaical pictures of Jesus that has been propagated by organized religion. Have you ever been there where you sat back and you thought, man, like, I see what the Bible says and then I look at what the church is doing and there just seems like there's a, there's a missing element in there and so that has caused people to deconstruct. And here's what I've learned about this. I've learned that the church actually has forgotten the main thing. It's like building uh, an Ikea um, uh, dresser and not having all the pieces or the foundational piece and you try to build it and it's like there's things that are missing and we have missed it in our Western society. Come on, if you know what I'm talking about, put it in the comments because we've forgotten these two things. We've forgotten the importance of loving God and loving people. We've chosen to replace the message of Jesus, which is welcome for everyone. And we've replaced it with judgment and rules and religion and services and gatherings. And we missed out that church is about people. And so maybe you're listening in right now and you're like, man, I've deconstructed. Maybe you're in a place right now where you're like, man, I've questioned or I've doubted and I feel less than because I doubt or feel like I don't have the faith because I doubt. I want you to know that I'm a part of the Doubters Club. I doubt. I have things that I question. And so I want to read this passage real simple, but it says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as your qu yourself. And so my main question for you today is this, what things in life have caused you to question, to doubt, or to deconstruct your faith? What? What in life has caused you to question that? Is it what you've read? Is it what you saw? Is it the depiction that you've experienced from Christ? And I'd encourage you this, that here's a, a way to construct your faith that's really important. Many Christians have this flaw in their construction process. And here's that flaw. The flaw is this, that their pastors or their uh, family members or their friends have constructed their faith and then gave it to them. Think about that for a moment. That what has happened is in our world, we have been given a faith, it's been constructed, and we've said, hey, here's the faith, there's no questions, there's no knowledge, just take it at face value. Construction, though, is always done best with a manual. Come on, I tell you what, I've been trying to teach my son Zeke how to build things, and the biggest thing that I tell him, first thing to do, get all the pieces out, spread them out so you can see them all, and then I tell them, hey, get the manual and follow it step by step. And so what I wanna do is I wanna give you this main point for today. And I want you to, to think about this for a moment. Um, and then we're gonna jump into Luke, I mean, sorry, John chapter 20, verse 24 through 30. And last week I talked about doubting Thomas at the end of my message. And now we're gonna read his story. But here is the main point for today. Faith must be built on three things. Biblical knowledge, knowledge, tangible encounters, and personal experience. You can't have one. Did you see that? I almost dropped that. You can't have one without the other because you can have the knowledge and not experience or encounter God and you're missing it. But if you just experience encounter and you don't attach that to God's word, then you can go off on tangents. And so when they're working well together, you have a great constructed faith. And so it's funny, we're gonna look at this story of um, Doubting Thomas, who 
some could say deconstructed his faith, right? Like that he was a, um, he questioned Jesus multiple times throughout the scriptures. When Jesus died, even though he knew the message, he doubted and went back to fishing. And then finally he comes back and still doubts. And I think we all have those moments when our doubts arise and we wonder this question, like, what do we do with it? And I'm so excited that after I finish this conversation, that you can jump into something we call our after party, because this is just gonna be an intro conversation about doubt and fear and deconstruction and reconstruction. And I wanna encourage you to, to begin to write your questions down, questions that you've actually feared to ask because you felt like you would be judged. And I encourage you with this, that as you grow in your knowledge, you see how big God is. Don't be afraid of learning more, but also realize that there's a mystery in God. There's a mystery in what he's capable of. And so let's look at Luke, I mean, sorry, I keep saying Luke. Let's look at John chapter 20, verse 24 uh, through 30. And this is what it says. It says, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. And this is talking about when Jesus resurrected and came back and he revealed himself to his disciples. They told him, we have seen the Lord. Have you ever had someone in your life that told you they saw something or heard something from God or believed something and you were like, man, I don't believe you. Well, this is where Thomas is. Thomas, although had heard that Jesus was gonna come back, the disciples were saying, he's back. And he's like, I don't believe it. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Then it says this in verse 26, eight days later, the disciples were together and again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing among them. He says this, peace be with you. And then he said, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into my wound on my side. Don't be faithless any longer. He says, believe. And then Thomas declares the most, one of the most fundamental foundational statements in all of the Bible. He says, my Lord and my God, Thomas explained. Now what you have to understand about this port is he's not amazed because Jesus is in front of him. But at this moment, he has, it. he has the knowledge, he has the encounter, and he has the experience. And he just says, oh God, like you are my Lord, my God. And it's this declarative statement of who Jesus is. Verse 29 then says, then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me, but blessed are those who believe without seeing me. I want to take a moment and I want to pray and I'm just going to answer what do you do when you're faced with doubts and then I want to encourage you to engage in conversation after our gathering with our team. So why don't you bow your heads. God, today I pray that as we look at these four things that we can do when faced with doubt, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. God, we love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to know today as we get ready to close that doubt is normal. I want you to know that in this process where maybe you feel like you're deconstructed, man, you can reconstruct it in a way that you take both knowledge and experience and encounter and put them together. And so I want to encourage you with this. When you are faced with doubts, number one, I want you to seek wise counsel. I love what Proverbs 4, 6 says. It says, don't forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. I wanna encourage you, get into conversations and relationships with people so that when you are faced with doubts, you have people that you uh, can talk to. Number two is this, keep asking questions. Man, maybe you've been told to not ask questions. I wanna encourage you today, keep asking questions. First Corinthians 8, 2 says, anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. Come on, have you ever met someone who's a know-it-all? They know everything about everything about everything. I tell my daughter this, Gabriella, all the time. I'm like, Gabriella, it's actually okay for you to say, I don't know. Come on, if you're listening in right now, say, I don't know, right? Sometimes we don't want to say that, but it's okay to say, I don't know. Here's an interesting th fact about Jesus. In the New Testament, Jesus asked over 383 questions. 
Come on, this is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, has the ability to tap into God, and yet he, putting his deity aside, was willing to ask 383 questions. If Jesus, who knows all, can decide to ask questions, I'd encourage you to do the same thing. It's so interesting, kids ask an uh, average of 125 questions a day. Maybe you've heard this before, but adults, only ask six. Come on, when you're faced with doubts, ask questions because it doesn't surprise God and he's not afraid of your questions. Man, we have something called Doubters Club that's actually coming up this Monday night. And um, for those who are on the East Coast, at some point, we're gonna have that launched over there also. But here on the West Coast, we have Doubters Club, downtown Berkeley, 6.30 to 7.30 on the second and fourth Mondays. And it's a great opportunity where we're engaging around hard, difficult questions with those who don't think or believe like we believe. But it is challenging and it's helping each and every one of us uh, to grow. Uh, number three is this, which this one's really interesting but it's to keep a Deuteronomy 29, 29 journal. Um, in Deuteronomy 29, 29, God is speaking and talks about the things that God knows that we may not understand, but yet the things that we do understand, we need to continue to know and ask questions. And at this moment, what happens is the Israelites, although they were given the promise of the promised land, that God was going to bless them and expand their, their, uh, their nation and their people, they were actually in captivity. And there was a contradiction between the promise that God had and the situation uh, that they were in. And so I wanna encourage you to keep a list of hard questions you have for God. There's sometimes when things happen that we don't understand, but God does. There are times when God does things that we can't comprehend or we can't orchestrate or, or uh, wrap our minds around, but God understands. And so I would encourage you, when you have things that come up, like in that passage, 29, 29, where Moses is asking God these hard questions, God's okay with it. So keep a journal with these questions and then seek wise counsel so that you can engage around them or at our after parties. And sometimes you ask the question when you're dealing with stuff like that, like, where's the purpose in it? Have you ever had that moment where you, where you ask these questions, you're like, God, I just can't see the purpose in this problem or this issue. Keep that Deuteronomy 29, 29 uh, journal. Here's the last one. This is so interesting also. When you're faced with doubts, I wanna encourage you to take a foot, two foot field trip. Take a foot, two foot field trip. It's so interesting in uh, Genesis 15, uh, God is challenging Moses as he's praying to walk outside of the tent that he is sitting in. I love what Mark Batterson says. He says, change of pace, change of place, change of perspective. There are times in our lives where we need to change the pace and the place and the perspective in order to see past our ceiling, in order to see the, the mounds of possibilities. And this is the same thing that happens to Moses. And so God challenges him to step outside of his tent. And here's the interesting thing when he made a decision to step outside that tent. When he was in the tent, his ceiling was eight foot. All he could see was the top of the ceiling. But when he made a decision to step outside the tent, he saw limitless, limitless possibilities because there were the stars out there and God had made this promise where he said, hey, your descendants are gonna be as numerous as the stars uh, in the skies. Here's what we understand that with the naked eye, as humans, we can only see 9,096 stars um, in our eyes. But in the Milky Way galaxy, there are over 300 million stars. God told Abraham that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Here's an interesting thing. There are 31,560 seconds in a year. If Abraham were to take a moment to count all the stars, listen to this, it would take him 10,000 years. That is crazy. And even crazier is that there are estimated 2 trillion years galaxies i just amass those stars in your mind i would encourage you when you're faced with doubts take a two foot step foot step out of your tent or out of your house or out of your room and just look up at the amazing power 
and expanse of God and just remember that his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. Now, I wanna encourage you that God is a big God. He's bigger than our problems. He's bigger than our issues. He's bigger than our doubts. He's bigger than our fears. He's bigger than what we've seen the church to be or the depiction or religion. Jesus is amazing. Today, I wanna to encourage you that as we get ready to close out our time, just like Thomas who doubted, he had the knowledge, but he didn't have the experience and the encounter. I wanna encourage you that when you take knowledge and you keep growing in knowledge and your understanding of God and you take experience and encounter where you get to know God, nothing is impossible. And God won't be afraid of your doubts, but he'll encourage you to lean into those doubts because when you lean in, that's exactly where God is. Well, hey, we're so glad that you're with us. I wanna encourage you engage in our after party. And next week, if you're on the East Coast, you are in person in Bethlehem. If you're here on the West Coast, man, and you are engaging digitally, I wanna encourage you, come on out to our gatherings, 1030 at, in Berkeley. So glad that you're with us. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next week.